بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم 9700 AS Bio June 23 paper 23 and this is the second video starting with question number 4 uh, food crops such as barley and wheat contain gluten gluten contains two proteins glutenin and gliadin so gluten contains two proteins glutenin and gliadin table 4.1 contains descriptions of the structures of glutenin and gliadin Complete table 4.1. This is table 4.1 by writing the level of protein structure that applies to each description. A gliadin protein is a single polypeptide that forms a compact structure. 20% of the amino acids in a glutenin molecule are glycine. Glu gliadin and glutenin molecules contain regions of beta protein shoot. So this will be. the primary why because it is telling us what is the number and sequence of amino acids 20% of them are glutenin and this is of course giving us the tertiary structure because it says a single polypeptide that forms a compact so can't be quaternary one polypeptide and gives a compact structure so this would be the tertiary structure then we come on to part uh, two of the question Many genes in eukaryotic cells contain introns. The genes that code for gliadin do not contain introns. Explain how a lack of introns in a gliadin gene affects the protein. RNA from the primary transcript. So if uh, it doesn't contain any introns, so what is not going to happen? RNA splicing is not needed. We do not need to do any RNA splicing. Uh, the primary transcript is a coding sequence. You see where they get the, we get the uh, pre-mRNA, then the mRNA. But this, of course, would be the main primary transcript is a coding sequence. No nucleotides removed from the primary transcript and no process of exon joining. No introns, uh, so introns do not need to be removed. Uh, you cannot do alternative splicing and only other post-transcriptional processing occur. So, from the DNA, we're not going to get, usually we get a pre-mRNA and then mRNA. So here we will just get the mRNA directly because there are no introns. So the introns do not need to be removed because if the introns are removed, then the exon needs to be joined. And then that is called the mRNA. So no such thing was only one mark, but of course you had a lot of uh, marking scheme points for it. And I'm going to give one which is the most relevant one. So RNA splicing not needed, no nucleotides removed, no process of exon joining. Now coming to the B part of the question, celiac disease is a condition in which the immune system of a person responds to gluten in their diet. In celiac disease, there is a response to the presence of peptides, short chains of amino acids that are produced as a result of gliadin digestion. The gliadin peptides produced as a result of digestion are often as large as 33 amino acids in length. Intestinal cells take up large number of these peptides at the same time. Suggest and explain how gliadin peptides are transported into intestinal cells. So if they are large, they have to be taken up by endocytosis. And then you give me the details of this that it uses ATP and there's invagination of the membrane and it forms an endocytotic vesicle. So you have to give me all that because it's a large 33 amino acids long, so it's, it's a very large uh, protein. So endocytosis. So endocytosis, use of ATP, invagination of the membrane. Part uh, B, part two of the question. Uh, the presence of gliadin causes the immune system of a person with celiac disease to respond by producing anti-gliadin antibodies. Discuss the sequence of events that result in the immune system producing anti-gliadin antibodies. Uh, presence of uh, foreign antigen, then this is recognized and the activation of the B lymphocytes and then clonal expansion of the B lymphocytes and then the T helper cell secretes or uh, release cytokines. Cytokines stimulate the B lymphocyte response. Uh, B lymphocytes differentiate to form the plasma cells plasma cells produce antibodies. So basically it's a whole story about B lymphocytes and T lymphocytes. So any four out of these um, seven points, gliadin acts as antigen, 
एक्टिवेशन ऑफ बी लिम्फोसाइड्स क्लोनल एक्सपेंशन ऑफ बी लिम्फोसाइड्स टी हेल्पर सेल सिक्रीट साइटोकाइन साइटोकाइन स्टिमुलेट द बी लिम्फोसाइड रिस्पॉन्स बी लिम्फोसाइड्स कन्वर्ट इन टू प्लाज्मा सेल्स एंड मेमरी सेल्स द प्लाज्मा सेल्स प्रोड्यूस एंटीबॉडीज क्वेश्चन फाइव फ्लोएम एंड जायलम आर स्पेशलाइज इशूज इन्वॉल्व इन द ट्रांसपोर्ट ऑफ वाटर आयन्स एंड असिमिलेट्स इन प्लांट्स अ फोटो माइक्रोग्राम ऑफ अ ट्रांसफर सेक्शन ऑफ अ ड्राई कॉट स्टेम इज शोन इन फिगर फाइव पॉइंट वन यूज लेबल लाइन्स एंड लेबल्स टू आइडेंटिफाई द फ्लोएम टिश्यू एंड जायलम टिश्यू वन नेचुरली दिस इज गोइंग टू बी द जायलम एंड दिस इज गोइंग टू बी द फ्लोएम सो xylem and the phloem then describe how the sucrose is transported in phloem sieve tube from the photosynthesizing leaves to other parts of the plant now basically it is transported by mass flow entry of sucrose into phloem sieve tube then companion cell through the plasmod as matter then sucrose is dissolved in water then transported down a hydrostatic pressure gradient how does this hydrostatic pressure is created water moves into phloem sieve tube by osmosis when sucrose enters it uh, of course reduces the water potential so water from outside is going to move into the phloem sieve tube by osmosis from a higher to water, uh, to lower water potential increased volume this of course increases the hydrostatic pressure now at the sink in other parts of the plant like the roots or some other parts sucrose is unloaded and water follows uh, osmotically so that creates a low hydrostatic pressure there are many points but you could have to give me only four so number 1 is transport is by mass flow number 2 sucrose enters into the phloem sieve tube from the companion cell you see they are not asking you the story about the companion cell because i'm sure many students would have written that sucrose is dissolved in water it moves down a hydrostatic pressure gradient water moves by osmosis into the phloem sieve tube when sucrose enters this results in increase in volume so increase in hydrostatic pressure now somewhere else in the roots or anywhere which is the sink the sucrose is unloaded and water follows osmotically so that creates a area of low pressure and this mass flow is from a high hydrostatic pressure area to a low hydrostatic pressure area and that is called mass flow Now coming to this part of part two of the question, cyanide ions inhibit the activity of an enzyme involved in respiration. Suggest by the treatment of photosynthesizing leaves with cyanide results in less sucrose being transported in phloem sieve tube. So you see, if you look at it, this is the sieve tube, and this is the companion cell. Now hydrogen ions are pumped out. but when hydrogen ions diffuse back in they bring along with them sucrose so hydrogen ions pumped out by active transport but the hydrogen ions tend to diffuse back in through facilitated diffusion and they bring along with them sucrose this is the normal thing in companion cells now when you say less respiration so less respiration means less atp produced from aerobic respiration less atp for the sucrose synthesis in the mesophyll cells yes that is also needed for sucrose synthesis because glucose is made in photosynthesis and then some of it is converted to fructose and then the glucose and fructose combine to form sucrose now in the context of companion cells you say less atp for the proton gradient active transport of proteins out of the companion cell so this process requires atp So if there's going to be less ATP, there's going to be less uh, hydrogen ions pumped out. This is called the proton gradient. So less less hydrogen ions will come back in. So less sucrose will come back in. So when the hydrogen ions come back in, and then we've got the plasmod as matter here. So we've got, if you look at this place, we've got plasmod as matter here. so the plasmod as matter are going to allow this to come here and enter the sucrose is going to enter here now what is going to happen less atp of proton gradient less sucrose is co transported into companion cell and less sucrose diffuses into the phloem sieve tube through the plasmod as matter you know these are the plasmod as matter we are talking about these are the plasmod as matter here 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 right so basically you have to be telling me all this story and then uh, that would get you your two marks but you must know it to be able to give me these uh, all the story 
very important that you know how to word your answer. You might know the entire biology, but if you don't know how to word your answer, I'm sorry, uh, you won't get many, you won't get a good grade then. Less ATP produced from aerobic respiration. This is here. A less ATP for sucrose synthesis, less ATP for proton gradient, less sucrose co-transported, decreased diffusion of sucrose. Now coming to the C part of the question, a student was asked to carry out semi-quantitative Benedict's tests on two solutions. Solution A was extracted from the cytoplasm of cells in the mesophyll tissue of photosynthesizing leaves. Cytoplasm of the mesophyll cells. And solution B was extracted from the phloem sap in the phloem sieve tubes. So one is from the cytoplasm in the mesophyll cells and one is the solution B is from the phloem sap. The solutions were taken from the same plant and other variables were standardized. For each solution, the student measured the time taken for the first color change to appear. Suggest so which of the two solutions would change color in the shortest time. Means whichever one had more glucose would change color. Please remember, Benedict's test is only for reducing sugars. It would not test for sucrose. Sucrose is a non-reducing sugar. So this is the thing that should have come to your mind immediately. The cytoplasm of the cells, yes. It's a photosynthesizing. So chloroplast photosynthesizing making glucose, but the glucose is immediately converted to starch. And if it is taken from the phloem, the phloem only has sucrose. So everybody must be thinking on those lines when you're doing this question. So it says the solutions were taken from the same plant and other variables were standardized. For each solution, the student measure the time taken for the first color change. So more glucose, early the color change. Less glucose, more time it will take for the color change. You see, the glucose reacts with the copper and immediately changes color. Suggest which of the two solutions, A or B, would change color in the shortest time. Well, actually, you could do either. First of all, you have to tell me that Benedict's does not react with non-reducing sugar, does not react with sucrose. Or you said Benedict's only reacts with glucose. Well, that's the same mark scheme point. Now, if you said solution A, now solution A was from where? Solution A was from the cytoplasm. So you can say, yes, solution A, sugar present in the cytoplasm, mainly glucose, while solution B is mainly sucrose. So the A would convert would have more glucose in it and uh, B would not have glucose in it. But you could have also said solution B because it contains a high concentration of glucose more than the cytoplasm because in the cytoplasm the glucose is stored as starch. So both the answers were correct. You could have given me a good explanation and got away with it. So possibility of answers were uh, rather weird. Benedict's does not react with sucrose. You gave me that point. You got a mark for that. Sugars in the cytoplasm. So solution A uh, would change color in the shortest time. Or if you said B, then as glucose in the phloem present in cytoplasm, it is stored as starch. So there probably be a little bit of glucose in the phloem and that would change color fast. Now coming to the last question, which is question number six. Polysaccharides such as glycogen are composed of thousands of monomers. And you know glycogen is made of alpha glucose, only cellulose is made of beta. So starch and glycogen both are made of alpha. And there's amylose and amylopectin in starch. When in glycogen, there's only uh, one, uh, there's only alpha glucose, but there's no other two types. So in uh, glycogen, we have one, four, and one, six bonds. In amylose, we only have one, four glycosidic bond. But now they're talking about polysaccharides as a glycogen are composed of thousands of monomers. Okay, fine. Now, oligosaccharides, oligo means small. Oligosaccharides are carbohydrates because they contain only 3 to 10 monomers in their chain. Nistose is an example of an oligosaccharide. The structure of nistose is shown in figure 6.1. Now, you see, this is a 6 carbon, and then this is a 5 carbon, then this is a 5 carbon, this is a 5 carbon. So you look at it very carefully. This looks like glucose. This looks like fructose. This is again fructose. This is again fructose. So it says state three differences between the structures of nistose and glycogen other than the number of monomers in the molecules. So nistose is not branched. Glycogen is branched because it has one, four and one, six bonds. 
Now, the glycosidic bonds, Nistose has one type of glycosidic bond and glycogen has two types, one four and one six. Uh, while in Nistose, it appears to be one two glycosidic bond. Now, two types of monomers in Nistose. In Nistose, there is glucose. This is one type of monomer and this is the second type of monomer. So, two types of monomers in Nistose. In glucose, in glycogen, there's only one. There's only alpha glucose. Then Nistose contains one glucose. Now, this is only this one is the this one is the glucose uh, in Nistose, while in glycogen, of course, there are many many alpha glucose molecules, thousands of them. Then uh, glycogen monomers have a six-sided rings, and Nistose has six-sided and five-sided rings. Right? Glycogen monomers have six-sided rings, and Nistose has six-sided and five-sided. Then uh, fructose in Nistose and no fructose in glycogen. So lots of points which you could have given me, but unless you of course knew the structure of it only then you would be able to figure it out. Many of you feel that you can't do this, but I always say is that because uh, you have not been had the confidence to really do it, but you can make columns. Whenever you ask to do a comparison, you can't do columns. Of course, the mark is for the whole thing to be correct, like Nistose not branched, glycogen branched. Then the second point is Nistose is 1-2 glycosidic bond, glycogen is 1-4 and 1-6 glycosidic bond. Then in Nistose, there are two types of monomers, in glycogen is only one type. And in Nistose, there's only one glucose, in glycogen, many alpha glucose units joined together. Then in Nistose, there is a six-sided ring and a five-sided ring. In glycogen, they're all six-sided rings because they're all alpha glucose. And in Nistose, fructose is present and it is not present. So this is how you would do this. And you can, you can always do that. There's no sort of thing on the front page. It's not written that you can't draw columns or you can't do this. So I'm sure you can all be confident enough to do this and get your marks. Now coming to part B of the question, uh, cells use oligosaccharides to synthesize glycoproteins which are transported to cell surface membranes. Describe the role of the rough endoplasmic reticulum and the Golgi body in synthesizing glycoproteins. And this is for four marks, so anything, four points you would have given me, so you can go talk with the rough endoplasmic reticulum first. You can say translation uh, will occur at the ribosomes, then the polypeptide is folded. Then it is pa packaged into a transport vesicle for transport to the Golgi body. Then in the Golgi body, packaging occurs in the Golgi body. Uh, and then in the ref rough endoplasm, you can say modification, uh, the glycosylation of the protein, or you can say attachment of the sugar or the carbohydrate. Then checking for misfolding. And then is this called post-translational modification. And then, of course, it is uh, then taken to the cell membrane and get attached there. So any of these four points you could have given me and that would have been very relevant to this question. So polypeptide synthesis at ribosome, you could have even said protein synthesis at ribosome, then polypeptide folding, which occurs in the lumen, or you can say protein folding, then formation of transport vesicles to the Golgi, then packaging into Golgi vesicles, then the glycosylation of the protein, which means attaching a carbohydrate part or a polysaccharide or attachment of sugars to the uh, protein uh, because it's got to form a glycoprotein. And then, of course, checking of the misfolded protein. And now we come to the last part of this uh, paper and this question. State one role of glycoproteins in the cell surface membrane. Now, glycoproteins, the role of glycoproteins in the cell surface membrane is, of course, very, very clear. The cell signaling. And uh, they can be receptors for hormones or chemicals or molecules and then cell recognition. Then they act as cell surface antigens or they're also involved in cell-cell interaction. So a lot of points in any one of these would have been fine. So all these points were very relevant. Cell signaling, receptors for hormones, cell recognition, cell surface antigens and cell-cell interactions. And that completes this paper. And thank you very much.